it's interesting that the farmer and the physician have been trained by the same chemical companies. And so we have been indoctrinated into the same pharmaceutical codependence and worldview, whether we be farmer or physician. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's Pharmacy Lynn F F A R M A C Y, a place for conversations that matter. And if you ever wondered about why the soil and our own microbiome are both important and connected, and how we need to rethink healthcare and agriculture, our guest today, Zach Bush, is going to provide a lot of insight about that, and it's worth listening to. Zach is a physician. Uh, he's a specialist in many things, <laughs> and even things that he's not specialized in, uh, including internal medicine, endocrinology, and hospice care. He caught my attention because there are very few of us doctors out there who understand the intersection between the soil and the soil health and the microbiome of the soil, the human microbiome, and our own health, and agriculture, and all these intersecting pieces that are really going to determine the future of our species and the future of the planet. So it is probably the central thing that's most important. It seems kind of geeky, but actually is something that we're not hearing that much about. And so when I started paying attention to what Zach was doing, I was like, I got to talk to this guy because he somehow connected the dots and I've connected the dots. And so we've got to connect our dots together. Uh, he's an educator and a thought leader on the microbiome as it connects to health, disease, and food systems. He's founded the Seraphic Group and the nonprofit Farmers Footprint to help develop root cause solutions for both human and ecological health. He educates people all over the place. I see him bringing his wisdom everywhere. Uh, and he's really helping us understand the role of soil and water ecosystems and how that connects to our genetics, our immune system, our gut and brain health. Uh, he has really shifted away from chemical medicine and chemical agriculture and pharmacy to understanding a new path for farmers, consumers, uh, and big industries to work together to create a healthier future for us uh, people on the planet and the planet. So welcome, Zach. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Mark, to be here with you. It's a real honor. So you, you've uh, really uh, told your story many times, and I, I want to really dive into uh, the moment when you really began to understand the intersection of the microbiome, the soil, human health, ecological health, planetary health, because most doctors don't think like that. And, you know, you had training in traditional specialties, critical care, and, you know, hospice and internal medicine, and, and, and you really had a traditional training, but you kind of moved into this new framework. And I'm just curious, what was the epiphany moment for you when you were like, wait a minute, I'm missing something here? So many of them, you know, it, fortunately, life is not, not linear. And fortunately, we cannot write our own lives because it would be very boring in the end, I think. So <laughs> the, the non-linear pathway that I followed, you know, and that kind of beginning of the aha moments came around uh, my chemotherapy development. I was doing research and development for uh, novel chemotherapies at the University of Virginia. And my focus was on mechanisms of apoptosis, which is programmed cell suicide within cancer cells so that we could perhaps develop technologies and, and uh, medications that would allow us to uh, inspire cancer cells to kill themselves rather than trying to poison them or rather than trying to you know cut them out or whatnot and or rely on an immune system to go find each and last one of those last cells. So the idea that we could turn on this cell suicide process was exciting. New chapter, this was kind of 2005, 2010 era. And uh, so my research was really focused on uh, vitamin A in the end. And I was working with vitamin A compounds that were capable of turning on this apoptosis and tumor cells. And it was my, you know, aha moment a couple of years into that, that vitamin A is rich in things like carrots, you know, and so oh. that possibility <laughs> that, wow, wait, what if, you know? It didn't just come in and, a lab in a pill, right? <laughs> that's right. I really thought that in the first couple of years, I was calling them retinoids and we had all these kind of pharmaceuticalized names that we were using for the compounds, but then in the end they were, you know, extracted from vitamin A. And, uh, and so that was my beginning aha moment. But one of the poignant ones, you know, came through a really challenging evening where I was trying to give one of my patients uh, who was, had been enrolled in my early clinical trial for this kind of first time retino retinoid. And every fiber in her body seemed to be telling her not to put this, you know, pill in her mouth. And I knew it was safe. I told her it was safe, took her through all the science of why it was safe, why I was going to hurt her. And and then I, you know, that not being effective, I then took her into why her cancer was likely to kill her if we didn't do anything about it and blah, blah, blah. There's no existing therapies that would work and blah, blah, blah. And used a fear paradigm. And finally, after 45 minutes, she swallowed that thing. 
And in the end, you know, I succeeded in a, as a clinical trialist that day, but I failed as a physician that day because I really broke this woman's intuitive will and her intuitive knowingness about what she needed or what would be her best, best path. And that was a really destructive moment for my paradigm because, you know, in the couple of days that I recovered from that emotional journey, <laughs> realized that there had never been a case of cancer in the history of mankind that had been caused by a lack of chemotherapy. And so in that moment, suddenly realized that no matter how good I got at doing my trade, no matter how inventive I got in my chemotherapy, I was always going to be going down a, a, a wrong pathway or a very ineffective pathway uh, that was getting at a symptom rather than a cause of something deeper. And so that was the beginning of my, my big 180 after 17 years of academic training in medicine and practice and teaching and chief residency and faculty and all, you know, the indoctrination that happens at all those levels is quite profound. And so it's taken me, you know, 12 years since that time to kind of re-engineer all of my learning into a different worldview or philosophy around the fact that nature knows how to do this thing that we call health. And we have an opportunity to participate in that as physicians. That's powerful. So that was a big epiphany of, of really trying to understand that you really couldn't work against nature, that you had to work with nature and this patient and it. And she, she knew herself intuitively, but uh, you know, given your training and all that we're taught, we, we kind of can be bullies as doctors sometimes, <laughs> you know, we like, we know the right way. We're going to tell you what to do and we're going to give you this medicine and it's going to work. But the truth is, you know, that most of health doesn't really occur by, uh, uh, you know, a uh, deficiency of a medication. It occurs, be, because we we actually are are not providing the right supports for our ecosystem of our health, and I think you're an ecosystem doctor. I become an ecosystem doctor, and I think that's a very rare breed. And I I think you know you you seem to take that insight that you had and you brought it into connecting somehow to the microbiome and nutrition, and then that led you to the soil. So take us on that journey and how you connected all those dots. Yeah, the, you know, I, I left academia after I spent a year trying to start my clinic in in the academic center of University of Virginia, and there were so many you know bureaucratic barriers. And the biggest barrier to starting a nutrition center for reversing chronic disease happened to be the dietitians. Uh, the dietitians just could not handle the idea of a plant based clinic being introduced because they had were so steeped in an understanding and science around the food pyramid and the important for you know, animal proteins and all of this in the diet. And, you know, it was really uh, sad to see an inability to have conversation with our dietitians. Ultimately, at you know, one poignant moment, I had the, the head dietitian uh, who led the whole diabetes education platform, really brilliant, you know, been in academia for 20 years. She was literally crawling over the, the, the table screaming, at me in my face about you know this desire to start this clinic and that was the moment where i was just like i, I don't think i can do this <laughs> and so went through a short period where i thought maybe i just couldn't do it at all and then you know this was now 2009 and suddenly the bottom fell out of academia universities were losing funding rapidly as the recession moved through uh, in this time and so it became obvious that there was an opportunity to really transition my career out of academia and started a, a nutrition center in rural Virginia in a food desert in a town of 550 people with the idea that if I could find a nutritional curriculum of education, um, I would be able to really change you know, the, the disease epidemic, the chronic disease epidemic of, of the country. The, uh, and Virginia is close to ground zero, right? <laughs> and it's it, West Central Virginia. Virginia is the obesity yeah. and the you know diabetes rampant, and you know you can definitely meet forty year olds with end stage peripheral vascular disease from diabetes and uh, you know the metabolic collapse of our our food system and everything else. So definitely was in ground zero, and for the first time I was a real physician. You know I was suddenly through. 24 seven, a lone doctor out in a rural community. And I was suddenly doing everything. I was suturing people up, which I hadn't done in years. I was, you know, taking care of, you know, uh, major depression and psychological disorders and schizophrenia, stuff that you would never have to see as an endocrinologist in the hospital system was suddenly coming through my door. And so I think I learned how to be a physician in those first few years in that rural community. I actually uh, spent four years in Idaho, <laughs> in a similar town, mm. an, old, an old logging town, four years, just really being the family doctor and there were no other yeah. doctors and you were it, you know, there was a few other family doctors, but you know, there was a drunk surgeon in us and we had to deal with everything. And you really, it really is humbling. And you, you learn a lot about medicine that way. You do. And I think you know, my patients ended up becoming my best 
my best faculty. You know, they, they taught me so much in those years as I started to have the time uh, where my initial visits were two and a half hours long because I didn't have any patience. Like I, I was just like, a, you know, I was Come on, sit down, let's chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so uh, for the first time, I listened to patients for hours at a time and I just learned so much from that journey. I started to really understand the pathophysiology of disease much better because I could start to really ask, well, what was the very first time you felt unwell and, and now take me to this time where now you have metastatic breast cancer, you know, and you see a 20 year journey unfolding. And I think mm -hmm. I really learned the pathophysiology much more effectively than these snapshots of like lots of scans and tests and everything else. And, oh, you have stage four breast cancer, blah, blah, blah. Let me show you what you need. Instead, if you listen long enough, you know, the patient will 95% of the time tell you not only where, what kind of disease they have, they'll tell you where it came from and how, how they could change that trajectory by going up upstream to one of some of those catastrophic injuries that began the process. And oftentimes they're not even nutritional, they're, they're emotional, you know, traumas mm -hmm. or, you know, heartbreaks or abandonment or these, these catastrophic events that lead to a lack of self-care that lead to economic collapse or whatever it is that then leads to this cascade of self, lack of self-care, lack of access to good information and the rest. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, functional medicine is really focused on this timeline. You go back to even pre-birth and what their intrauterine environment was like and what their family history is, and you take them all the way through their childhood, and, and you literally can map out a person's story. It's not random how they got to where they are. You can usually trace it back to some or multiple various factors or insults or traumas or exposures that actually led them to have what they're having right now. And that's really a, an important piece that we miss in medicine. We're just so focused on the, the sort of singular reductionist view of disease. And, and somehow you were able to shift that and understand this sort of ecosystem model. Tell, tell me about the, the, the moment you sort of began to connect to the, the nutrition piece and then the microbiome, because you really have gone deep into these areas and far more than most physicians. Yeah, that's, you know, actually tied into my cancer research quite a bit. So my research was focused on mitochondria, which are uh, elements within the microbiome. These are archaea. Um, archaea are the, you know, precursor to modern bacteria. So, you know, somewhere around four billion years ago, three and a half billion years ago on planet Earth, we see the emergence of the archaea. And then, uh, and then you know, within half a billion years afterwards, we start to see more modern versions of the bacteria that, that thrive and, and you know, create most of the biodiversity. But one of those archaea bacteria were absorbed into a more complex methane producing bacteria some billions of years ago, uh, it seems in the fossil record to create the first mitochondria. And at the moment that we had a functional mitochondria, it changed the way that energy was produced in the cell. And so my research in, in chemotherapy was around maximizing the the signaling system out of mitochondria so how do these ancient bacteria that live and thrive within our human cells create all of the energy for ourselves and create a network of communication within our cells how do they communicate back to something as complex as our genome or our pathways of, of uh, enzymatic function so that was my area of research and i didn't think of them as microbiome i thought of them very much and i think i was really trained to believe that they were part of the human cell and they yeah. were just like this little organelle inside the human cell. Nobody told me they were microbiome. Nobody told me they Well, they look like creatures. bacteria. If you look at them under a microscope, they look like little bacteria. And they're, they're, they're actually, they're, yeah. they have different so, DNA, actually, than, than your yeah, whole they DNA. They have their own genome, which isn't taught to us either. Like, we're not taught. You know, maybe I hope that med school students today are, but certainly in my generation of physicians, we were not taught at all the fact that mitochondria have their own genome and that they are archaea makes them very unique. Like, the, the new stuff around genomics is fascinating around this, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, I guess. But, um, you know, the, this was the entry point to when I started a nutrition center and started seeing people not responding to health food regimens that have been proven out for 40 mm. years from the likes of Colin Campbell and Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic. And, you know, I was applying, you know, masters, uh, you, know, uh, you know, level of information that these guys had produced over the years to my patients and seeing them fail. I was seeing them actually get worse, not better on things like kale. And so I was trying to figure out why kale could cause an inflammatory reaction. And it took me a while to believe that the patient was actually eating the kale. Like I thought, well, maybe they ran out and ate a Twinkie at the same time. Like I really blamed the patient for a long time before I developed enough relationship to find out that I really trusted them and, and actually came to realize they were eating healthier than I was. And so in that journey, 
you, we had to start asking really tough questions about what is kale look like today to find out that it's devoid of alkaloids, the medicine within the food, to find out that it's actually got an abnormal ratio of soluble to insoluble fibers compared to kale 20 years ago, to find out that it's laced with a chemical called glyphosate or Roundup was a big aha moment for me. And so that was the journey into you know mm. realizing that we were going to have to look deeper than just a nutrition protocol and start asking tough questions about the food, which immediately took us into soil. And so yeah, wait a minute. That, that, that's powerful. I, gotta, I just got to unpack that. So you're basically saying that you realize that your patients were eating what you thought was good food. They weren't responding it. And so you traced back to what the quality of the food was and what it was missing compared to decades ago when we had better soil and that it had lower levels of fiber and lower levels of nutrients. It had lower levels of other compounds. It even had higher levels of compounds like glyphosate, which I really were going to get into with you about it. So, so you, you just sort of connected the dots. And that is, that is a moment when you, I guess you realize that you can't just go to the grocery store. You have to go to the farm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And at that moment, this was like 2012, you know, we were studying those soil. We were starting to study soil and we found a family of molecules that are vast and, and, variety, each species of bacteria and fungi are capable of making 10 to 15 variants of these carbon molecules. And they happen to look a lot like the, the chemotherapy I used to develop that was disrupting and, and changing mitochondrial metabolism. And so I suddenly realized that the soil could potentially hold, you know, highly intelligent medicinal qualities to it, which that ultimately really, you know, proved that not only do we have issues with our farming industry in regards to its productive quality, we had a, 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 perhaps a deficiency at the soil level of medicines that had never been discovered before. And, you know, I'd always had this vision and I was dealing with plant medicine. I was, you know, doing vitamin A extractions and all of that. And then, you know, fast forward in my clinic and I'm trying to use, you know, herbal extracts and I was investigating homeopathy. I was investigating, you know, uh, herbal medicine and all this stuff. So I was starting to really welcome in all this stuff only to find out that 4,000 years of, you know, looking at the plants for medicine might have missed a deeper story that the microbiome of the soils were capable of producing even a more, a higher level of intelligence uh, within my, within the cellular systems of communication, nutrient delivery and the like. So that was the closing point of, you know, where I really pivoted at that point. And I started a, a biotech lab at that moment uh, and start studying soil and the possibility of a whole, uh, you know, medicinal capacity to soil. And so that's what we do now. We, we produce oh. uh, out of uh, Virginia uh, soil compounds that, that uh, carry carry these carbon molecules. Okay, this is really a radical idea. I just want to pause and emphasize this because we know about the rainforest and we hear about the medicinal plants and all the medicines that come out of the rainforest. And nobody thinks of dirt or soil being a, yeah. a reservoir of compounds that have utility in human health. And yet we know there are a lot of things in soil that have produced medicines. A lot of medicines do come from the soil. And what we're finding is that we're driving the extinction of our soil. So we, we don't think about, oh, the destruction of the rainforest, the destruction of the soil. We're nobody's really talking about that. There are a few people like us, but it's really not out there in people's consciousness that soil is actually so critical for human life on the planet, not just to produce food, but as, as a reservoir of all these compounds. So take us down that road and, and tell us what kinds of things specifically you find in the soil that people don't know about that are so beneficial and helpful that we've discovered. Yeah, it, you know, we could spend hours on that in a lot of different directions, but to focus it in on these carbon molecules for a moment, because I, I think it's a profound new concept of medicine in general. Not only is it a novel source, you know, coming from soil, but it totally changed my whole perspective on what we should be doing as physicians or a, a pharmaceutical industry, which is instead of trying to micromanage a single pathway, so something like NRF2 is commonly talked about. So NRF2 is you know, a pathway that regulates a bunch of our oxidant, antioxidant relationship to the world around us, and inflammation cascades can be really disrupted when NRF2 is affected and things like this. So, mm -hmm. so we align with that as a pharmaceutical industry, say, okay, we want to find things that upregulate or downregulate NRF2, and we try to find you know, man-made chemicals that we can patent and change that you know, pathway. From the nutraceutical world and dietary supplement world, we say, okay, we want to find a bunch of plant things or, you know, natural compounds that can affect NRF2. And in this way, I think that, you know, while we're moving in the right direction, obviously, with functional medicine and integrative medicine, we have a tendency to kick the allopathic medicine mindset off the stool and then sit right back up on the same stool and simply offer a different 
you know, toolbox to do the same reductive kind of uh, effort towards changing biology or micromanaging the NRF2 pathway with this, this beet extract instead of with that pharmaceutical drug. But in the end, we're failing to realize that the NRF2 pathway is perturbed for a reason upstream. And so we tend to be very reductionist in our mindsets and we tend to focus on symptoms as the problem rather than an upstream phenomenon. Hi everyone, hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, the 10-Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC, and I call that system the 10-day reset. The 10 day reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, click on the button below or visit getpharmacy.com. That's get pharmacy with an F, F A R M A C Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. And so these carbon molecules, when I saw them, were very unique because I had studied extensively redox chemistry and mitochondria, which are oxygen-based compounds that allow for the release and exchange of hydrogen and therefore electrons. And so redox chemistry intracellularly is mainly produced by the mitochondria and they allow for trafficking of information. So it literally works as a liquid circuit board inside your cell system to coordinate cellular behavior at complex levels. And that redox chemistry is in that is a wireless communication network between the systems, between cells even. They have to go through gap junctions because they can't go into the extracellular space because the extracellular space is too, too variable in its osmolality, its pH, it's you know, all of these different things that can destroy that domino effect of oxygen-based redox chemistry. What I found. Wait, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you go to the next thing, I just, I just want to unpack that for people because it was a mouthful. <laughs> uh, so what, what you're basically <laughs> saying is there is inside your cells a balance between antioxidants and things that are free radicals or oxidants, and that balance is critical to health. And when it's out of balance, it changes all the chemical signaling in your body that can lead towards disease. Did I get that right? Spot on, yeah. So redox okay. is a is a reduction of words of re- reduction and oxidation. So oxidation is the, the the pulling away of an electron from the environment, and reduction is an addition of an electron. And so by moving electrons between reductants and oxidants, you can get a stream of electricity. And so to create a wireless network of communication at the cellular level, you want to pass electrons. And the oxygen molecules that are produced by the mitochondria, when they produce a single molecule of ATP, which is kind of the fuel that we're, we're purportedly running on, the, the ATP production in its you know, byproducts is producing a bunch of you know, 15 different variants of these oxygen compounds. They're things like ozone, hydroperoxide, O2H, which is kind of the opposite of H2O, and all of this. And so very unique oxygen-containing molecules. The issue or the limitations of intracellular mitochondrial-based redox chemistry is that every one of those oxygen-based molecules only lasts for about a millionth of a second. And so they are down in the quantum physics realm of communication. If you try to take that quantum environment outside of the cell into like a soil system or into your gut lining, you lose the capacity of that that domino effect or electron potential because you can't maintain a, a, a consistent current. So what we found in soil was these large carbon molecules with the right side of the, the molecule looking a lot like the redox chemistry chem, uh, that I used for my chemotherapy. And so the idea that this big carbon backbone would be produced by bacteria and fungi to stabilize uh, redox chemistry in, in extracellular environments was super exciting. It, it really, it was just massive goosebump moment when my colleague and I were going through this white paper on dirt I didn't know anybody knew anything about dirt, let alone a 90-page you know, white paper on soil science. I was blown away paging through this thing. This molecule 
goosebump moment of not only is there medicine in the soil, it could be so much more stable and deliverable as a medicinal kind of effect than our oxygen compounds and the, those that would affect it. The exciting thing about redox chemistry, again, is it resets our concept of a medicinal. Instead of trying to affect a single pathway, in fact, instead of trying to do anything to a human body, for example, all you're trying to do is reconnect the communication system so that the cells can communicate. And when cells have uninterrupted information, they become healing machines. They know how to mobilize stem cells if they're too damaged to repair. They know how to repair themselves at a faster rate. They know which proteins are missing. And so that was the excitement. And as we started putting this into cancer cells and, and neurons and proximal renal tubules in our lab, we were immediately seeing things we had never seen before. And, and this was a cumulative experience of like over 120 years between the scientists that were involved and everything else of basic science looking under microscopes, John Gilday, PhD, you know, UVA, you know, master of microscopy and cell biology. He was seeing things that had never happened before under the microscope. And it was because for the very first time, we were not treating human cells and health and disease as if it was an isolated event. We were bringing in a, a biologic compound of communication network made by bacteria and fungi and introducing it to a petri dish. For the first time, we were watching biology happen in the context of an ecosystem. And the last 10 years you know, journey has just been mind-blowing to find out how powerful we are as healing machines when endowed with, with a communication network that's up and running. So how are you using the soil science that you learned and this, this, these microbes in the soil that actually regulate these pathways, how, how is that linked up to human health directly? Yeah. Make so, it a little uh, practical. How do, how do we actually see this yeah, in so, real life? So the first thing that we did was study uh, gut lining because we had come, John Gilday had done a lot of work uh, around, um, you know, a deep reading and, and understanding of glyphosate, which is the Roundup, you know, active compound herbicide most ubiquitous chemical that we spray in the world, over 4 billion pounds a year now into our soil systems, water system around the world. And so this molecule was ever present in his mind. And one of the main things that this molecule was becoming recognized to be capable of was destroying barriers. And so it could break down the gut barrier, it could break down the blood vein barrier, kidney tubules, and this would lead to a leaky sieve event and the chronic inflammation in the population. And so, of course, the debut in 1976 and then the spraying directly of wheat in 1992 and then the GMO crop of Roundup Ready uh, genetic modification in 1996, you can see that the uptick in chronic disease, autoimmune disease, inflammatory conditions of neurologic degenerative conditions, all of these upticking with every introduction. And the ground zero seemed to be in this protein destruction of the tight junctions. These are the Velcro-like proteins. As soon as we put this wireless- That's what people call leaky gut, right? Leaky gut, leaky brain, you know, leaky kidneys, you know, and the symptoms tend to be, you know, bloating, poor digestion, poor energy level, fatigue after meals, cravings, poor sex drive, poor sleep quality, brain fog, you know, uh, short-term memory loss, and then inflammatory conditions of vascular disease, diabetes, metabolic collapse, obesity, all of that. Are, is set up by the breakdown of the single protein, which is so interesting that ground zero is like, you know, boiled down to simply. The Velcro that holds all of those cells together is called tight junctions. And as soon as we put this communication network back in, we saw something extraordinary happening, which was cells knew how to lace themselves back together. So we could destroy a gut membrane, small intestine or colon immediately. Within six minutes of, of Roundup, you've got massive leak going on. But if you gave it back a wireless communication network made by the microbiome, those cells would lace themselves right back up into a cohesive, coherent, highly protective barrier. We've subsequently we've shown this on, on the blood-brain barrier. We've shown that the relationship between the gut and the brain injury is very interlaced. If you give Roundup and, and gluten, for example, to the br brain barrier directly, it doesn't do much. But if you first give gluten and, and Roundup to the gut lining, then the, the blood brain barrier uh, blows apart. And so it's so interesting to see how this cascade of putting this chemical roundup into our food system set us up for this breakdown in these different barrier systems. And it's so beautiful that here is the chemical that we're destroying planet Earth's soils with, and yet she planted as an antidote to this chemical, these compounds within her soils 60 million years ago. And that's how we extract these carbon molecules. So we go to a fossil layer of soil, uh, in the Southwest United States, and we then bring that to our labs. We crush that into nanoparticles, and we go through a multi-stage process to uh, liberate small carbon molecules and get hydrogen to bond to the oxygens again and get a redox effect. And when that 
system of communication and from fossil soils goes back in to a, a modern human experience, it's unbelievable, you know, what can happen. And again, it's not because the compound's doing anything, it's because the human cell is capable of that when it's grounded in the intelligence of soil, when it's grounded in the intelligence of nature. And so that's been the journey towards this, you know, extraordinary realization that if we don't fix the agricultural industry, we're going to fail. So now our biotech company with all of its supplements are channeling all of our profits back into root cause solutions. And one of those being our nonprofit, which is an awareness and education effort to allow, allow chemical farmers to realize that they're actually the most potent members of change for the transformation of human health. And this is poignant because they are facing the highest levels of chronic disease in the world. The last 90 miles of the Mississippi River that collects some 80% of the Roundup in our, in our environment is cancer alleys. We, we see farmers with thir, you know, third time, fifth time cancers of different organ systems. Their children are affected by ADHD and autism and brain defects. And I've seen just the most horrific stories of, of tragic human health on these farms as we've been filming over the years in these environments. And so it's, you can only imagine how devastating it is to, I give these talks out you know, with PowerPoint presentations, literally in farm fields. And so we'll, it'll go dark while I'm showing apart. And these farm families are just riveted, sitting around on bales of hay, listening to this story, realizing that their children's diseases that they're treating and their own cancer is coming from the very chemicals they have to handle every single day. Well, you, that you just said so much. And I, I'm just literally blown away in an awe because this is this is a, a such a, a untold story that within the soil itself is the answer to the damage that we've done to the soil and ourself through the chemicals we've used in our agricultural system. So glyphosate Roundup, like you said, it's four billion. I've heard six billion pounds. It's the most abundant agricultural chemical that's been used in the world. It, it is uh, used on 70% of crops. It's abundant in things that we wouldn't even think of. The top two sources of glyphosate in our diet are hummus, basically garbanzo beans, and lentils, which you think of, oh, that's a health food. That's a plant-based diet. But unless they're grown organically, it's not just the GMO soybeans. And, and, and it, it has, you know, vast effects on the soil, which I want you to get into, including chelating all the minerals so the plants get the minerals. It destroys the mycorrhizal fungi, which are the, this network of fungi in the soil that are necessary for the plants to extract the nutrients. It's just so complex. But what you're saying is, is that when you looked at this ancient soil, you were able to extract compounds that then you can use to fix the damage that's done to humans from the glyphosate, which is just mind blowing when you think about it. And it's mind blowing. Yeah. And, and, and I think when you're talking about leaky gut and, and the gut permeability and tight junctions, I think mean, this is really the foundation of functional medicine, which is looking at the gut and how the gut has led to so many chronic illnesses. So when you look at the microbiome, it's linked to everything from depression to cancer to heart disease to diabetes to obesity to Alzheimer's to autism to ADD to, you know, you name it, autoimmune diseases, allergic disorders. And, and, and a lot of it has to do with leaky gut. And, and it's not the only reason, but glyphosate clearly is, is a factor in driving this and, and it has so many broad reaching implications for how we treat our, ourselves. And what's so striking is that, and I've heard you talk about this, is that now there's, there's this, this, this change that happened around glyphosate where Monsanto was bought by Bayer. And, and now they're trying to shut down glyphosate. They're paying billions of dollars in settlements and they're putting in this new chemical, Liberty something, I think you talked about, that I think is actually maybe worse. So, um, you know, how, how do we then begin to shift the agricultural system to one that actually gets rid of these chemicals, that actually helps to restore soil, that helps to solve some of these problems at the root and actually deals with human health problems by fixing the soil? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I, I think, you know, to begin with the mind-blowing part, you know, the, the reason we're going to 60 million-year-old soil for our source is because, again, the, the more biodiversity you have in the bacteria and fungi in a soil system, the more diverse you have of these carbon molecules. And the importance of that is that in different pHs and different osmolalities and different, you know, changing environments throughout your own gut or throughout organ systems as they change, there's different carbon molecules that are going to be more available, more bioavailable, more biofunctional at those different environments. And so the more biodiversity you can get in that communication network, the more effective you're going to be at lacing all of this together. And the striking thing is just how little soil is left on the planet. We are now calculating that 97% of the world's soils are severely depleted. Uh, and, you know, that 
it's just jaw dropping how much damage we've done in such a short of time, short period of time with chemical agriculture as we scaled that globally. And so it's really a, a you know a fifty year story of chemicals. But interestingly, it was over plowing that destroyed the soil infrastructure before the chemicals hit. Yeah, so right. Tilling. We you know the tilling is is really damaging to the the. the you mentioned mycorrhizae, which are totally bizarre structure, but the mycelium is the, you know, the root system of, of, of the fungal world. And then in this bizarre quantum relationship with root fibrils, they inspire this totally new structure called the mycorrhizae to appear. And nobody understands what mycorrhizae is. Nobody knows how mycorrhizae knows how to be mycorrhizae because it, can't, it doesn't exist as an entity if you have lots of, of mycelium around. It doesn't exist if you have lots of plants around with root fibrils. You have to have the combination of the, the fungal world with the complex multicellular plant world before you can get mycorrhizae to form. And so it's some bizarre like exudate or hyperintelligence between these species <laughs> systems that will create this new structure that interestingly is a biophotonic structure. And so what's really happening when we talk about plants or soil or humans or you know corn is we're talking about a biophotonic phenomenon where you have solar radiation coming in with all of its energy potential hitting the surface of the earth and its plant life or microbial life within the soils. And then there's an intelligent process in which that biophotonic energy is transmuted to you know, uh, ATP or in the plant, it's different little uh, you know, things like chlorophyll and, and all of the you know, phosphorescent plasmids that create energy within the plant bio, you know, bio mutating, bio transmuting the biophotonic energy of the sun into soil energy. And the soil energy is picked up by this interesting mix of, of microbiome between bacteria and fungi that's then passed into this electrophotonic transfer mechanism of the mycorrhizae that will then go into the root system of the plant, take that back into the plant that will then go into an animal consumer, human or otherwise. And so that's this beautiful complex system. And then you take Roundup and it functions as an antimicrobial at every level. And so it's been patented as an antibiotic, it's been patented as an antifungal, antiparasite. And so it starts to come into this chemical, you know, this beautiful array of biophotonic transformation through all of these species interaction and starts breaking the cycles. And so what we've achieved through a very short period of time is a soil that's devoid of the, of the nutrient and energy density, the little biophotonic energy that it would get from the sun because it's lost its workforce. And that workforce can no longer translate that information into something like a plant. And so we grow through, you know, petroleum inputs, green plants that are devoid, not only nitrogen just of fertilizer. nutrients. Yeah, nitrogen is MPK, so it's nitrogen, awesome. phosphorus, and potassium. And so the MPK fertilizers are used to create green plants that grow fast and have high yield, but they're lacking that intelligence of that whole system that we just described. And so not only are our soils depleted, they've lost the mechanisms by passing energy on through from sun to, to plant to human. And so this is why I believe we look like we do as a society right now where you know recent Medicaid uh, screenings are showing 52% of our children with a chronic disorder or disease by the time they're 16. That's compared to 1.2% in the 1960s, right before we debuted these chemicals. Wait, so, wait, wait. You just said one in two kids are having chronic disease? Chronic disorder or disease. So someone we don't call diseases, but we call it you know, asthma or eczema or uh, you know, Im immune sensitivity to their food or the air they breathe or whatnot. So that's uh, staggering. percent of our children by those staggering. things. Staggering. One in two kids. It's, it, yeah. And, and, it, and at first, when you say that statistic, you're like, that can't be right. Until you walk into an elementary school and take a look around the room, and you can immediately see kids not only with eczema, you can see kids with full-blown psoriasis in elementary school now. Uh, and so the amount of gut you know, disruption that you need to, to develop an autoimmune condition you know, near psoriasis is devastating. So, and then you see this you know, explosion of leukemias, lymphomas, and weird sarcomas in children that used to appear in 80-year-olds are showing up in children under the age of two now. And so we're, we're showing this just decimation of, of biologic youth or you know uh, regenerative capacity within human biology in this most recent generation the scary thing is right now we're looking at generation number two of roundup babies in our rodent studies that we just you know reviewed for the epa the third generation is where the devastation really gets out of control yeah and we, i saw we've that never seen that generation it's epigenetic now. effects which generation three so if the grandmother gets exposed the mother may or may not get sick, 
but the grand little grand rat gets sick and yeah. they get kidney disease and cancer and all sorts of hormonal disruptions and endocrine things, which is kind of scary and they've never been exposed. So it's these transgenerational effects that actually have, have consequences and things that we can't even imagine on our children. And I, I think that, uh, you know, these dots are not getting connected. Why do you think there's so much, um, you know, resistance to actually looking at the science around this? Because there seems to be ample science. I mean, the EPA has said it's safe. Uh, Trump said to the, uh, the makers of Roundup, don't worry, we got your back during these lawsuits. I mean, I think, you know, w w how do we kind of break through and get people to really understand the, the impact of glyphosate as, as one of the most noxious compounds that's ever been invented? And by the way, it came from the same people that brought you Agent Orange, Dioxin, PCBs, and DDT. So they're in good company. <laughs> Yeah, they've been masters at toxins. They, they know they know their industry well, so they're masters of their trade. You know, I think you know I've given up with the EPA. You know, with this last cycle, just in November, you know, me and a team uh, of nonprofit and scientists showed up, and we just reviewed 96 you know scientific studies done in universities and private labs around the world over the last few years, showing that the extreme toxicity of Roundup. And at the end of that, the, the director of the EPA panel that we were you know, presenting to stood up and said, everything that you've just presented is irrelevant to us. We're regulators, not scientists. You haven't filled out any forms to suggest how, how this is relevant to us. And, you know, and, and furthermore, you know, we were really hammering on this generational toxicity as, our, as like the most scary piece of data out there. And she said, and by the way, there was a piece of legislation passed two and a half years ago that makes it illegal for the EPA to consider generational toxicity data. So your, your argument is irrelevant to us. And so that wow. was the end of that, you know, that hour and a half of effort, you know, of, of science demonstration. So at that moment I was like, okay, your change cannot come through these regulatory environments. It's just, it's never going to, never going to be fast enough. And there's too much special interest, you know, mounted against change in this industry that drives billions and billions and billions of dollars. It, it really pales in comparison. So, you know, Monsanto sold for $66 billion and that was pennies on the dollar because they had all this pent up, you know, uh, a court system uh, taxation that Bayer bought with it. And so Bayer just settled for $6 billion, which was only 10% of the purchase price of Monsanto. And now they own, you know, 85, 90% of the seed industry for, you know, 70% of the, the land around us and everything else. So it's, it's just an insane amount of ownership that this German company now has over the world. And they're the ones that, of course, put out Liberty Link, as you mentioned. And so Liberty Link is another GMO that was approved by European Union and uh, US and, and Canadian regulators just a year before they made the move to buy Monsanto. And so they got their own GMO approval. And now you can see the smart you know, business decision like, okay, we want to get this new thing on the market, but Monsanto has the whole corner on the market. The only thing we can do to really move Liberty Link in in a meaningful way is to buy Monsanto. And yeah, they've got a bad press. Everybody hates Monsanto now. And yeah, they're, they've got all this, you know, 10,000 cases. And now it's over 30,000 cases in the court system that are, you know, trying to sue them for their cancer that they've developed from Roundup. What we'll do is we can buy that up. We can then, you know, sell the hell out of Roundup for the next few years while the court system slog along. And then we could sweep in as the as the, the white savior. knight, perhaps, and, <laughs> and savior and say, oh, we're taking glyphosate out of the market. You're a stupid American company. Hit all of this data from you that they knew it was causing cancer, and they're just evil people. But we're good people. We're going to pull that off the market, and we've brought you Liberty Link. And Liberty Link, unfortunately, is already growing throughout the whole Midwest of the United States. It's already you know very prevalent GMO crop. And uh, it's scarily, it's sprayed with a chemical that it's you know genetically modified to handle which in, instead of disrupting uh, the glycine amino acid pathways that glyphosate does, uh, it, it disrupts glufosinate and, and some of these other amino acids that are critical for human reproduction. And so the, the mix of you know, having this residual of Roundup in our systems for another 50 years combined with this new toxin uh, getting integrated, we can really start to map out the extinction of, of humankind over the next few decades. And then glyphosate lasts for up to 20 years in the soil, right? Yeah, the, the vary between you know six hours if you listen to Monsanto, and then, and then out to fifty years, depending on which science you're looking. Yeah, at. and I I heard a scary fact that that uh, you know it chelates minerals, so it literally binds to minerals and it sticks on them like like glue, and and so your whole wheat, which has more minerals because it's whole, 
has 40 times the glyphosate as white, <laughs> as white flour, which you think you're doing something good for yourself, but you're not. So this is a lot of stuff that people have to think about, um, the connection between their health and the soil health and the chemicals we're using and the need for a new form of agriculture and the sort of broad implications for our society as a whole. But it seems like there, there is a place of hope right now happening as I see it. There's, there's this massive movement and you're part of it. Uh, the Soil Health Academy, Rodale Institute, you've got, you know, policymakers starting to advocate for regenerative agriculture. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the governor of Pennsylvania, you know, just put forth $22 million to help transform all the local farmers into regenerative agriculture who wanted to do it. And so, so there's really movement in this direction. Um, how do you see that getting out there in a, in a meaningful way and, and being catalyzed? Because still, it's still fringe, it's still on the margins, but it, it seems like we're, we're in this almost tipping point moment. So how, how do you yeah. see things happening in the business world, in the science world, in the policy world that are moving us in this direction? For me and my group, we've decided not to focus any attention or put any energy into conflict with the current status quo. We, we see the current status quo as self-destructive. It, it, it's a totally unsustainable model for agriculture. Same way for allopathic medicine. We have a completely unsustainable model of, of disease care in this country that's you know going to bankrupt the, the, the nation over the next few years. And so we don't need to fight against that. We need, don't need to argue with them. My choice is to let them actually be on their happy way and make you know a few more trillion dollars in, in the journey of their their demise while we need to start to really engineer the new future that we all want and so uh, we're putting all of our energy into that new pathway rather than trying to be you know adversarial conflict with with the status quo and so in that journey you know it takes a multifaceted approach and so everything from you know big philanthropic funds that we're working with uh, to channel energy and science towards understanding our relationship to viruses and the microbiome so we can change the, the wasteful, you know, trillions of dollars that have been dumped into trying to kill a virus that doesn't even, that's not even alive to begin with. You know, all of this, this kind of misinformation that's, that's shutting down global economies and everything else with this pandemic is just showing the lack of science. So everything from kind of re-educating and infusing large capital into science that's being being done correctly to show that viruses are a critical part of human biology and their interaction is is that of kind of marrying the microbiome to human biology and vice versa through genetic swapping that's critical for you know not only biodiversity to occur but also adaptation within a species to occur so you know trafficking money through those philanthropic environments and then we're we're working on the organization of of a big you know for-profit impact fund as well because we see the need to bring very large capital in and there's huge rationale for this we have a 1.7 trillion dollar american agricultural system that's going to pivot over the next 20 years we know it is because the old system is dying the soils are dying so fast now anybody who's doing chemical farming in 10 years has a non-viable you know uh, system and so we just need to make sure that we've invested properly such that universal adoption of these practices when it becomes necessary, is easy to do and quick to adopt. Uh, we don't, we can't stand for an organic, you know, slow, linear process of change. We need to catalyze true exponential rates of, of transformation, which is going to mean investing in land, certainly, so that we can help speed up the the land management practice shifts, but also investment in, uh, you know, uh, ag tech, where we start to see innovations in hardware and software platforms to allow for a distributed distribution system, a distributed food system. We have too much yeah. of a centralized food system, and this is making us vulnerable in these times. So those are some of the broad brush drugs that we're tackling. It makes sense. You know, you just sort of have to create the new and let the old just die out in a sense and yeah. show there's a better way. Because, you know, we've had many, many people on the podcast who've talked about it's not as just a noble idea that's morally right or scientifically right, but that it's economically the best choice. And it's the best choice for our health. It's the best choice for reviving rural communities and helping and supporting farmers and providing uh, a solution to the chronic disease epidemic that we see globally. So this is a sort of a win, 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 win solution that, that, that does disrupt people. I mean, there are people who are going to be losers. I mean, there will be the big seed and ag companies and chem companies and the banks and aren't going to like it who aren't providing little loans to the farmers anymore to buy all those chemicals. And, and I think, I think we're going to see some changes, but I, I do think that there's a moment happening where, where there's an increasing awareness of the need to change both 
um, how we uh, grow food and what food we eat and actually make them um, both regenerative. And I think that, that if we can reimagine healthcare to be regenerative healthcare and reimagine agriculture to be regenerative agriculture and understand how they're related and how important and connected they are, then, then I think we, we, we have some hope. And so despite the fact that it is a really tough time, uh, not just COVID-19, but just the, the, the amount of economic disparities, the, the social inequities, the um, amounts of disease, the struggles that people have, you know, and the, and the, and the destruction of our environment and climate, you know, I, I do see this as a hopeful moment where, where there could be redemption through an embracing understanding of these principles. And essentially it's what you're basically saying is let's learn from nature let's adopt nature's principles, both in terms of how the body heals and how the earth heals. And let's just apply those concepts because it works. Yeah. Yeah. So much so that we've decided that the intelligence of nature is, is the, is the brand. You know, like you, you, you have to like get, you have to completely surrender the idea that as humans, we're going to somehow come up with some technological innovation to get us out of our scenario. The technology that we've developed as humans has taken us away from that intelligence of nature. And so starting to surrender ourselves as physicians to realize that microbiology is teaching us something important, which is communication is the heart of healing. And the biology is always striving for biodiversity and adaptation. And if we're failing to support communication, biodiversity and adaptation in our microbiome or our human experience at any level, we're going to undermine our state of thrive, our state of capacity for regeneration, whether we're a human system, a soil system or beyond. And so there's some deep lessons in our socioeconomics, our sociopolitics around when does communication become the focus again instead of adversity or adversarial you know, interactions. And so there's an opportunity here for us to really learn from nature to become co-creative in our relationships as humans and as members of this you know, spectacular you know, nature that we were born into. So I, I hope that we are in that transformative moment. I think well, the pandemic I, has given us an opportunity. Yeah, I feel, I feel like, you know, we've got a, a global timeout that God's given us a timeout, go to our rooms, think about all the crap you've done to screw up the world yeah. and, and sort of come out when you're ready to deal with it. So I, I, like I, feel, I feel like that's what's happening at this moment. And I, I just want to close by by having you share a little bit about the work you're doing with Farmer's Footprint, because uh, it's it's a really a profound thing. There are a lot of similar things going around Kiss the Ground and the Rodale Institute, but everybody's working towards the same goal, which is to sort of bring light to these issues. And Farmer's Footprint is a nonprofit coalition of farmers, educators, doctors, scientists, business leaders that are hoping to expose the harmful effects on humans and the environment of chemical farming and pesticide reliance and chemical chemical agriculture and, and providing a new direction around regenerative agricultural practices that help build diversity and reverse climate change. So tell us more about how this is being executed and what you actually are doing and just some some hopeful stories that we can end with about about this this sort of re reimagining uh, of healthcare and and reimagining agriculture, sort of like the phoenix rising from the ashes. Yeah, I, I mean, the stories that come out of these farms are so exhilarating because what we get to see is that, you know, these families that finally decide because their back is against the ropes, they're about to lose the family farm, they become so desperate that they're willing to make a huge leap in faith uh, towards this as like their last ditch effort to save the family farm. And so they stop plowing for the first time in the you know, in, in a thousand years, that land. And so they stop plowing and then they stop, you know, spraying the chemicals or whatnot. And so these are environments like Australia, the U.S., Europe, I mean, a ancient history of farming and the plow was invented in 900 AD. So we've been doing the wrong thing since the beginning of civilization, as we call Western civilization. And, and to see these families transform in a single year their land to a point of verdant capacity that they are now growing crops that have no weed infestation at all because there is such vitality within their soil and plant life diversity and their multi-species cover crops and just this pure, pure biophotonic potential within these plants are pressing out pests and, and weeds by their own vitality rather than having to be codependent on and some sort of pharmaceutical approach to knock back it. It's a huge, beautiful lesson to us as humans is if we connect back into soil through a vibrant food system, we're going to become so biophotonically bio active <laughs> that we will press disease out of ourselves and we will become a healthy and resilient people. And really, you know, our, my greatest hope is for this third generation of Roundup children. Let's not let them be the, the most diseased 
human you know point in history let's let them realize the potential for healing that will reverse out of that that epigenetic doom that we've set for them let them find a pathway into a new epigenetic hope through their reconnection to, to real food real soils and a real healthy soil water e- ecosystem of the planet so i i see you're getting to the the farmers and and they are clearly at a pain point right now because their incomes are declining, their yields are going down, their farms are struggling, and they're facing increasing climate instability and weather changes that are threatening their farms, and they're desperate. Um, and you're, you, you know, they're in a moment of being ready to change. But how do you change doctors? <laughs> how, how do you bring them into the mix? Because farmers' footprint is also about bringing in doctors and, and yeah. people who are in the healthcare profession. So how do you help them understand this? Because they're still pretty tied into the medical industrial complex and the pharmaceutical and, uh, and surgical fields. And, and listen, there, there, there are places for that. You and I both know that, you know, thank God for modern medicine for so many reasons, but it isn't a solution for chronic disease. And that's what we're trying to do is apply uh, a model of care that was developed for acute illness to chronic illness and it's failing. Yeah. I mean, I, I is a challenging, you know, journey for sure. But I want to know because I'm trying change, to do it, and I'm like, if you have any ideas, I want to know what they are. <laughs> That's right. It's certainly a challenge, but I think that you know, in the end, it's a, it's interesting that the farmer and the physician have been trained by the same chemical companies, and so we have been indoctrinated into the same pharmaceutical codependence and worldview, whether we be farmer or physician. So that's an important jump. And so whatever you're experiencing as a physician and feeling trapped in your paradigm, know the farmer is experiencing the same sense of failure to, to communicate, failure to connect to the potential. And the solution for both farmer and physician is the same, which is new community. And so when we start to surround each other by like-minded intention for a new reality, our, our speed of innovation is dumbfounding. Imagine reapplying you know, the trillions of dollars of medical education that's gone into today's you know, modern medical doctor field to rearrange that into a, a planet-centric, nature-centric philosophy, the innovations that we will come up with in regards to the way that we think about imaging or therapies or whatnot is going to radically shift. And we are smart, intentional human beings that can, when re- reorienting our North Star, totally transform the industry nearly overnight. And that's what we see farmers doing for sure on the ground. And I really have seen in my own life, every time I surrender the sense of need for an antidepressant or an antibiotic or whatever the drug is that I'm reaching for, surrender the set belief of the need of that and start to look for the root cause solution within my patient. How do I connect them back to nature so, so that they find that vitality that they are naturally born to, with the capacity to realize? And that's where we're going to find that innovative spark. I can do it as an individual and make these tiny little progresses with my little team, but we're much more excited to engage the entire world, the farmer, physician, and, and the like to, to generate a, a rate of change and a rate of innovation that's only spoken to in paradigm shifts. It's only you get, you get times. the light bulbs go off in the doctors. Can you get the light bulbs to go off in the doctor's For brains sure. when you're talking about this? For sure. Because we're all in it. You know, we, when you're on the front lines, you can see how ineffective it is. I don't care <laughs> if you're in ER and ICU, you can that's see true. how ineffective our system is. And so the darkness is there. And so turning on a light in the darkness is very powerful. You know, I see this over and over again with when I give a lecture around this stuff or do a podcast. By and large, the two sentiments are, oh, my gosh, my mind is blown. And I already knew all of that. <laughs> yeah. So there's this wonderful, like, cross section of, like, why didn't those dots get put together before? And I already knew all of that stuff. And it, it should be intuitive, whether you're a consumer, a farmer, or a physician. The, the, the reality of nature is obvious at every every turning point of our experience and ultimately if we look to our experiential knowledge instead of our book knowledge we're going to find out there's a huge disconnect between those two and what we've been experiencing in the hospital systems and our clinics and in the fields of our farms is not what they taught us in the chemical industries you know mm-hmm. education toolbox and you know it's, it's perhaps not surprising that it's the same chemical companies teaching the farmer that are teaching us as physicians and so we just have a very limited worldview that when we are give each other permission to blow that up. The amount of synergy, the amount of co-creative, you know, innovations that we're going to be capable of is going to be astounding. That's just so amazing, Zach. I mean, you're 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 laid out a vision of healthcare and agriculture in the future that, while very depressing at moments, is actually very hopeful and and connects the dots to things that really few people have connected. And I'm just so grateful for your work and can't wait to see what happens with the farmer's footprint and your biotech company that's bringing the ancient soil medicines to humanity and uh, 
listen, if we can figure out a solution for leaky gut, boy, <laughs> that is just tremendous because it's a lot of work to heal a gut and, and using these ancient soil microorganisms and the compounds they produce to, to solve some of these big crises in health we have now is just such a great vision. So I'm, I'm, I'm on your team. I'm excited for what you're doing. And I think that, that, uh, you know, more of us out there talking about this, uh, is going to make the change. And I, I do think we have to start bringing together healthcare and agriculture and maybe virtual conferences now because we can't be a person, yeah. but we need to start to get farmers and doctors and agricultural scientists and, um, and, and, and human scientists together to really solve these issues. Cause, cause there is a solution. It's, it's not like, Oh shoot, we, we screwed everything up and there's nothing we can do. There actually, there is a path forward and it's actually pretty hopeful, but you sort of have to look at what's really gone on to, understand we're in this crisis moment and you know and some moments i go well you know maybe we we're just not going to survive like human humanity might not survive the planet it'll be fine it'll it'll recover you know it'll i mean i, I watched this uh david attenborough uh nature movie one time and and there was this great uh, show on chernobyl and it showed how every every all the humans left and nature took over and all the plants came back and all the animals came back and it's like aren't they all radioactive but it's somehow nature is just yeah, so thriving. smart and thriving yeah. and we just have to get out of the way so uh, i just appreciate your work zach for people who want to learn more they can uh, go to your website zachbushmd.com they can follow you on social media zachbushmd and check out farmersfootprint.us uh, i'd encourage you to watch the movie because uh, it's a really short little movie, but it explains a lot about regenerative agriculture, shows real farmers with real real issues that have found solutions. And you can learn more about Ion Biome at Ion Star, whatever that little thing is, that biome.com. So I, I love uh, your work, Zach. Keep up the good work. And hopefully we'll we'll be able to keep this conversation going when you make more discoveries and, and, and tell the story uh, in a more hopeful way. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you love this podcast, please share it with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. And please uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy.